us pray. Dear Lord, may graduation be a celebration of your life within us. We give you all the learning, the skills, and the hard work of these years. We pour out our gifts into your hands. May we hold this memory in our hearts as we continue on our journey. Father, may we live a life that reveals your hope and be guided in everything we do by your everlasting truth. Amen. Please remain standing and join us in singing the first verse of Amazing Grace. Good evening. On behalf of the 2014-2015 graduating class of Pleasant Valley High, I would like to thank each and every one of you for making the effort and coming out here tonight. Thank you. I would now like to introduce our speaker tonight, Mr. Todd Borders, who is the Associate Pastor of Hillcrest Baptist Church. Thank you, Destiny. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, my name is Todd Borders. I'm associate pastor of Hillcrest Baptist Church in Sachs, uh, but my home is in Pleasant Valley. Uh, I live in Pleasant Valley. Uh, I have two kids who attend school at Pleasant Valley. My daughter, Madison, uh, has just graduated from the sixth grade and is about to be a seventh grader at Pleasant Valley High School, uh, which is about to kill me. Um, my son, Cameron, is a, will be a junior uh, next year at Pleasant Valley. So this is my home. This is my community. Uh, this is my school. And uh, so it is an honor for me to be able to come and speak to you tonight, to be able to share with the, this graduating class. Uh, I know this is a very special time in your life. It's a very uh, memorable time for you, uh, for your family, for your parents. Uh, and I'm honored to be here to be a part of it. You know, 12 years ago... Uh, you guys began a journey down the same road in life. Uh, for many of you, it began here in this community at Pleasant Valley Elementary School. That first day of school marked both an end and a beginning in your life. It was the, the end of your preschool years and the beginning of your journey through school uh, toward adulthood. You know, and today, you are standing at the end of that journey. Uh, and it's also, uh, you're at a, an ending and a beginning in your life. You're, you're at the end of your high school years, your high school years are about to be in your rearview mirror. But before you is an entire world filled with opportunity. Um, you're closing one chapter of your life, and you're about to open another chapter to a whole new season of life. It's a season that we fill with opportunity, uh, excitement, and challenges. And I want you to know tonight that in the next few years, every one of you will make some very important, critical decisions in your life. Uh, matter of fact, the most important decisions that we make in life are, are usually made between the age of 18 and 25. Uh, you're going to make some decisions that will set the direction for the rest of your life. Uh, so it's critical uh, that you make the right decisions uh, when that time comes. And so I want to challenge you tonight as you stand at this pivotal time in your life, uh, I want to challenge you to make your life count. And I hope all of you were determined to make your life count uh, for the glory of God. And so I want to ask you to... Think with me, not just the students, but every person here tonight, um, to think about the number 28,000. It's a pretty significant number for each of us. Because if you're an average person, and if we live an average lifetime, we will live about 28,000 days on this earth. That's 670,000 hours or 40 million minutes. If you're trying to figure that out, that's about 76, 77 years. Now, some of us may live longer than that. Some of us may live shorter than that. But the average lifetime for the average person 
It's 28,000 days, 670,000 hours, 40 million minutes. And it goes by quickly. And when you're, the time of your life is over, I don't mean to be depressing, but one day our life on earth will come to an end. Whether it's 28,000 days or whether it's shorter or longer, there'll be a time when each of, each of us, our life on earth, will come to an end. Uh, they will place our body in a casket. They'll bury that casket in the ground, and somewhere above our uh, casket, there'll be a, a tombstone or a headstone, and on that stone, there'll be a few things. There'll be our name. Underneath that name, there'll be two dates, the date we were born and the date that we died. And in between that, those dates, there'll be probably a small dash, and that dash represents the life God allowed us to live on this earth. That dash is small, and it reminds us that the time of our life passes by very quickly. I mean, 28,000 days, 40 million minutes, 670,000 hours, that seems like a long time, but it's not. It goes by quickly. Many of you, I don't have to tell you that life goes by fast. Yesterday, yesterday, I mean, you were little boys and girls starting your first day of school. Today, I mean, that was yesterday. Today, just like that, you're young men and young women about to graduate from high school, about to go out into a world and make your mark in, in this world. The time of our life goes by quickly. The Bible tells us that life is short. The Bible tells us that our life is like a vapor. Think about that. I mean, God's Word says that our lifetime is like a vapor. It's like the steam coming off a hot cup of coffee, our breath on a cold morning, a vapor that's here for a moment, and then it's gone. It goes by quickly. But the Bible tells us something else. That when our lifetime on earth, the time of our life is over, every one of us will stand before a holy God, our Creator. And we will give an account to God about what we did with our dash, what we did with the life that God allowed us to live. So what I want to challenge you tonight is to make your life count. Because when your life is over, when our life is over, the date that we were born won't really matter. The date that we died won't really matter. But what will matter is what we did with that dash, the lifetime God gave us to live. So I want to challenge you to make your life count. How do we do that? Well, I want to look into the Word of God for a few minutes tonight. The book of Colossians. It's a letter written by the Apostle Paul. Uh, Paul was in prison in Rome. This was written around A.D. 60 to 62. Paul was in prison in Rome. He writes this letter to Christians living in the ancient city of Colossae, which was in the, uh, the Roman province of Asia in modern-day Turkey. Paul was in prison not because he was a criminal. Paul was in prison because he was a Christian. So he writes this letter to these Christians living in this ancient city of Colossae. He begins this letter by praising them and thanking God for their faithfulness. But then in verse 9, Paul tells these Christians, he says, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. Did you know that if you want to know what a person's like, you can just look at what they do. If you want to know what a person thinks, you can listen to what they say. If you want to know who a person is, you look at how they pray. Paul was a man of God. Paul was a man of prayer. I'm sure you have people in your life who's praying for you. Paul says to these Colossians, I'm praying for you. And then he names four areas in their life, four things he's praying for them. And basically to sum up Paul's prayer, he's praying that they will make their life count. So I want to look at this prayer of the Apostle Paul, apply it to our life, and see what you and I need to do in our life to make our life count, to make our dash, ever how long it is, whether our life on earth is short, whether it's, we're blessed with a long life, we need to live our life for the glory of God and make our life count for God. So Paul begins this letter. And I'll just read through a few verses of Scripture and work our way through it. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9, Paul writes, For this reason... We also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you 
and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. First of all, and I want you guys to please, this may be the, I don't know when you'll ever be together to hear the Word of God again. I want you to hear this. If you want to make your life count, your life must be guided by the will of God. Paul says, I'm praying that you will be filled with the knowledge of God's will. If we want our life to count, if you want your life to count, your life has to be guided by the will of God. And I want you to know tonight, God has a will for your life. You're not here by accident. You were created with a purpose. The Bible tells us that we are created in the image of a holy God. The Bible tells us that God said to, uh, uh, God, God spoke in His Word and said that, you know, it, to the psalmist, he says I, he knows us when we're in our mother's womb. Psalm 139 says that God knows us when we're, we're in our mother's womb and He has the days of our life fashioned before one day comes into existence. God has a will for your life. God's will for your life is always best. He said to Jeremiah, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, but to give you a hope in the future. God has a will for your life. God's will is always best. And God doesn't hide His will. God's will is revealed in His Word. And let me tell you what the Bible says specifically is God's will for our life. Not just their life, us as adults, as parents. This is God's will for our life. First of all, it is God's will that you be saved. The Bible tells us that God is not willing that any person perish, but that all come to repentance. That God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. The greatest verse that sums up the entire Bible tells us that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish but will have everlasting life. It's God's will that you be saved. The Bible also says it is God's will that we be Spirit-filled. Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says, Do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. To be filled with the Spirit means that our life is controlled by the Spirit of God. The very presence of God who indwells us, He lives within us, He is always at work around us. It's God's will that we're saved. It's God's will that we're Spirit-filled. The Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians it's God's will that we'll be sanctified, which means that we live a life of purity and holiness. So if you're doing those three things, if you're saved, spirit-filled, and living a sanctified life, an amazing thing begins to happen. God, who created you, the God of heaven, will begin to guide and direct your life. What are you going to major in? God will guide you. What career do you pursue? Who are you going to marry? God will begin to guide your life if your life is guided by His will. So if you want to make your life count for God, first of all, your life must be guided by the will of God. Second, our life must be grounded in the Word of God. Look what Paul says to the Colossians. It says, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, to ask that you be filled with the knowledge of His will and all spirit, uh, wisdom and spiritual understanding. He's praying that they may be filled with the knowledge of God's will in wisdom and spiritual understanding. Where does that wisdom and spiritual understanding come from? It comes from God's Word. So I want to ask you to do, to do something. I want everybody to participate. I want you to close your eyes. Just, just the... Just the seniors, we don't have to participate in this, but close your eyes. Don't peek, don't look at your neighbor, don't poke your neighbor when I, you do what I ask you to do, but I'm going to count to three, and I want you to point north. Okay, everybody close your eyes. Some of you are looking at me. Close your eyes. When I count to three, point north. One, two, three. Okay, there's, there's, okay now open, look around. There's fingers going every direction, okay? <laughs> Some of you are saying north is this way. Some of you say north is behind you. Some are pointing up toward heaven, toward the, like, everywhere. Now, if I want to know which way is north, if I'm depending upon you, I don't know which way to go. 
because almost every one of you, you're telling me to go in a different direction. There's only one way I can go north. There's only one way for me to know which way is true north. I would have to take a compass, and if I look at that compass, that compass will tell me which way is north. You're about to go out into a world filled with people, with influences. They're going to try to tell you which direction you're to go in your life. You're going to enter a world that tells you, you know, what's right, what's wrong, how to live. There's only one source, one compass that can direct your life and lead you in the right direction every time, and it's the Word of God. Seniors, listen to me. This is not just a book. This is the Word of God. Over 2,000 times, just in the Old Testament, over 2,000 times, the Bible tells us that what's written in these, in these pages was spoken by God. The Bible tells us this is God's inspired Word. It's not just a book. It's the Word of God. Read it to be wise. Believe it to be saved. Practice it to be holy. It contains light to guide you. It contains food to nourish you. It contains comfort to cheer you. This is the Bible. It is the traveler's map. It is the shepherd's staff. It is the pilot's compass. It is the soldier's sword. It is the Christian's character. It's the Word of God. And if you're going to make the right decisions in your life and make your life count, make your dash count for the glory of God, you have to be grounded in the Word of God. The psalmist tells us the Word of God is a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our path. And you're about to enter into a, a world filled with darkness. And I pray you'll let God's Word be a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. So we must be guided by the will of God. We must be grounded in the Word of God. And Paul tells us something else. He prays that these Christians will be genuine in their walk with God. Verse 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord. What does it mean to walk worthy of the Lord? In the Bible, the word walk is used to describe our life, our conduct, our behavior. Paul says, live your life worthy of God. If you're a Christian... Live your life worthy of the name you profess. If you're a Christian, live your life worthy of the Lord who gave His life for you. Walk worthy of God. When we live our life and we walk worthy of God, some amazing things happen. Paul says that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him. When we walk worthy of God, our life pleases God. I want to live a life that pleases God. He tells us, um, be fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power. These are benefits that come to us when we walk worthy of God. And it says that for all patience and long suffering. You know what patience is? Patience is the ability to deal with difficult problems. Long suffering is the ability to deal with difficult people. In your life, you're going to face both. And Paul says as we walk worthy of God, he will give us the guidance we need to deal with difficult problems and difficult people. There's a fourth thing we must do. We must be grateful in our worship of God. And I'll end with this. Paul tells us in verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints and the light. If you want to make your life count, be grateful in your worship of God. What's the motivation of our worship? A heart filled with gratitude to God. Every one of you have so much to be thankful for. Everybody in this room, we have so much to be thankful for. You need to be thankful to God for His love and grace and mercy in your life. You need to be thankful for your parents. Make sure you thank your parents, your family members who have loved you supported you, provided for you, encouraged you, prayed for you. Be thankful to your grandparents, your other family members, your coaches, your teachers, your pastors, your leaders. There are so many people who have played a part in your life to impact your life. Be thankful for those people. 
Let me read to you a, a story, and I'll close with this. But I want you to know some of the most powerful words you will ever speak are the words, I love you and thank you. Those are powerful. So make sure you say, I love you. And make sure you say, I thank, thank you. Make sure those words are a regular part of your vocabulary to those people who mean so much to you. Let me read this true story, and then I'll close. Over 100 years ago, there was a ship that sank in Lake Michigan with over 400 people on board. A young man named Ed Spencer heard about the tragedy. He ran to the lake. It was a stormy night. The waters were freezing. There was a severe undertow. But Ed Spencer dove into the freezing waters and began to pull people to shore. For six hours, Ed Spencer swam back and forth, battling huge waves, chilly waters, and ship debris with cut, which cut and bruised him. When light began to dawn, Ed Spencer had personally made 15 trips and rescued 15 people. He was exhausted and resting by a warm fire when he heard someone shout, There are two more out there. Though exhausted, Ed Spencer dove back into the water, barely able to reach the man and woman who were clinging to a piece of the wreckage. He brought them both in and collapsed on the beach. Only 98 people survived the shipwreck, and 17 of them were rescued single-handedly by Ed Spencer. Years later, an old man, as, as an old man, he was interviewed by a newspaper about his life. When the reporter asked if he remembered anything in particular about the rescue, he said, after all these years, the only thing I remember is that of the 17 people I rescued that night, not one of them ever said, thank you. Wow. When is the last time you and I said thank you to God for His love and grace and mercy? When is the last time we said thank you to God for our family? When is the last time you said to your family, your friends, your loved ones, your coaches, your teachers, those people God has used to have an impact in your life, when is the last time you said, thank you, I love you? Those are powerful words. 28,000 days, 670,000 hours, 40 million minutes, and the clock is ticking. Don't waste your life. Make your life count for God. Be guided by the will of God. Be grounded in the Word of God. Be grateful in your worship of God. Live your life for His glory and make your life count for Him. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank You and I praise You for being such a great and mighty God. Lord, I want to lift up tonight this senior class of Pleasant Valley High School. Father, I lift up every student up on this stage right now. Father, I know You have a will for their life. It's Your will that they be saved. I pray that every student on this stage knows You. They have a relationship with You through Your Son, Jesus. I pray that they are filled with Your Holy Spirit, that they're living a sanctified life, trying to honor You and please You. And I pray that, God, Your will will guide them Lord, as they seek Your direction for their future. Father, I pray You would protect them. I lift up their families, their parents, their grandparents. God, I pray Your blessings on their families. And I pray that, God, You would show each of these students Your will, Your plan for their life. Help them to make their life count and live their life for Your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good evening, and thank you all for coming. I know that the classmates I have behind me, along with myself, could not be more excited about starting a new chapter in the future. All through our years of high school, have, our years of high school have reached an end. The memories we made will last forever. Some of those memories, however, were made with some kids who aren't here today. As students of the class of 2015, we would like to have a moment of silence in honor of our classmates who are absent today. I know with, this, with a certainty that the angels we once walked the halls with 
will forever lead us to a brighter future. We will always remember the great memories you, get, memories you gave to us. So to our brothers and sisters above us, you will be missed as you fly with angels through the kingdom of heaven. The Universal Church offers food and shelter for the soul of mankind. No matter where you choose to go, you will be at home in God's church. Therefore, whosoever carries the light of God within your heart will always have a light to lead you home. We recognize Christ as the divine light in our lives. He is our greatest source of strength, comfort, and knowledge. We hope that from him and through him, we have given and will continue to give you our best support, advice, and love. Graduates, as each person lights his or her candle originating from the Christ candle, Please recognize that he or she represents all those many people who have held significant roles in your lives. They want to share God's light and love with you. We have nurtured and loved you, scolded and praised you. Wherever you go, you take with you the love of your parents, brothers, sisters, grandparents, and all the others who may be a part of your extended family. I represent the friends you've made thus far in your lives, as well as the other friends you will make along the way. As the song says, a lifetime's not too long to live as friends. May you have many. The Proverbs of Solomon begin, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment and equity, to give knowledge and discretion. These words could have been the stated goals of Pleasant Valley High School because we have tried to give more than information. We have tried to prepare you to continue to learn and grow in wisdom. A later proverb adds, a wise man will hear and will increase learning. Go forth with knowledge and truth. As Ulysses approached the end of his life, he recognized that he would make one more voyage to finish his illustrious career. At that same time, he understood that his son, Telemachus, preferred to stay among his own people in his own land. Inasmuch as Ulysses recognized this difference between himself and his son, he acknowledged the worth and importance of both their career choices. As he prepared to sail, Ulysses declared his acceptance and his confidence in his son. He works his work, I mine. Now you have the choice. Make it worthy of your ability.
I represent the many men and women who have lived and died to give you the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is through your allegiance that the United States of America can continue to be one nation under God with liberty and with justice for all. So we're getting close to the end. We do want to thank Williams this evening for opening up your doors to us, to the graduates. We want to also thank you for the delicious breakfast we had this morning. We are always so fortunate to have biscuit and gravy and bacon, and mm, it was good. I wish you could have all been here. It was wonderful. So we do want to thank all of you here at Williams for just being a supportive part of this community and a part of this, this school and these graduates. Thank our parents for coming out tonight, our friends, and the support that you give to them. I know that they all do appreciate everything that you do for them. Following the service this evening, there will be a slideshow, a senior slideshow, and you are all welcome to stay and uh, watch with them. After the graduates go out, we'll take just a few minutes to set things up, and then you're welcome to come back in and sit down and relax in the cool and watch a few pictures and, and have a little bit of fun. So we do invite you to, to come and do that with them. As we close this evening, I want to just leave you uh, one, one quick comment. Life has no limitations except the ones that you place on it yourself. Life has no limitations. So what will you limit for yourself? Is it your time? Is it your energy? Is it your education? What will those things be? And these are all choices, of course, that you will have to make. You have candles in your hands, and they have lights on them. And as you go out of this door down here, you're going to blow them out and put them in a box. But you have a choice to take that light, even though it may be snuffed out, and let it be a part of who you are. And I will challenge you this evening to take that light and do something with it. Not for yourself, but for somebody else. Take that light of God in you and do something with it to glorify him. No limitations. May God bless you. Stand. Please stand for the benediction. On behalf of the senior class, I would like to thank all of the friends and family in attendance tonight. Your support and encouragement throughout our high school years has been appreciated. Please bow your heads as we close in prayer. Lord, thank you for each person here tonight. Thank you for the caring teachers, administrators, and family members who have helped guide us to this point in our lives. Please be with each graduate as we begin the next chapter in our lives. Lord, guide us and help us to remember the lessons and values we have been taught throughout our high school years. Please keep each person here safe as we travel home tonight, Lord. In your name I pray, amen.